Welcome back to another episode. Jughead was back at the typewriter on Riverdale Season 7 Episode 5, writing four brand new horror stories. Each story was more gory and outrageous than the one before it. It was a gory blast reading this Tales from the Crypt-inspired chapter. It's hardly the first time Riverdale has done short stories. Chapter 122, Tales in a Jugular Vein is just one example. There have been instances in literature or historical periods when the plots were divided into distinct episodes, such as Riverdale Season 2 Episode 7. This structure is my favorite since it keeps the stories brief and the pacing rapid. There are no breaks, there are only climaxes. The same was true for this chapter. Additionally, framing it in a Tales from the Crypt-inspired manner made my horror-loving heart happy. My upbringing was filled with spooky tales, especially the cartoon Tales from the Crypt Keeper. Few individuals can surpass the Crypt Keeper, they might attempt, but it's a difficult position to fill. Much of that same magic was captured by Jughead's framing technique. Many of the beats in his four stories and the unsettling narrator were similar to those in Tales. The gory surprises, their perverted deeper meanings, and the crude humor were straight out of a comic book. Additionally, Jughead's stories make his thoughts clear because of his habit of putting himself into his writing. The first tale gave readers a tantalizing glimpse of vengeance and eerie justice. It's a straightforward story about bullies receiving their rightful rewards. Dilton Doily would be the one who would need a victory the most. Julian Blossom is a jerk in every universe, for real. As soon as he imprisoned Dilton in a locker, he received what was due to him. Dilton's surviving without suffocating is a miracle. The team was to blame for their problems, those lockers were cramped and had little room for movement. We got a good idea of how campy the stories could be from the basketball story. Come on, Dilton, are you playing basketball with his colleagues' decapitated heads? Very morbidly delicious. Except for the major, unexpected twist at the end, there wasn't much substance to it. All we had was Archie getting together with a mysterious female and learning the major secret of the family. I'm done now. There might not be a story because of a scheduling conflict. This chapter had a lot going on with four short stories and Dr. Werther's opus ed meetings sandwiched in between. A portion has to be sacrificed. Unluckily, it was this story. The story of a beloved who is keeping a dangerous secret may have resonated more strongly if there had been more development. Additionally, it had a lot of potential, and the plot is the kind of urban legend you would share around a blazing campfire. Additionally, seeing Cheryl infected and dressed in a wedding gown was a horrifying sight that made an impression. Although there was something here, the narrative lacked complexity and twists. The third story is comparable in this regard. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed reading about Betty's poisonous hairstyle. The concept was great, and it's a well-known urban legend, just like the second story. <clears throat> Similar to the second narrative, this one's premise can be distilled down to only one main point, Betty's obsession with her hair and a lesson on vanity. Sometimes an urban legend doesn't require anything else. Betty was intent on wooing men with her beehive. Due to the layers that were added before the major twist, this story stood out despite being brief. In her few scenes, we discover a lot about Betty and the reasons she turned to her beehive. Her enormous ego, the jealous girl's harsh remarks, and her desperate search for love ultimately proved fatal. Betty developed into a fully realized character who was handed a harsh lesson in the tale. Yes, it was cheesy how the Black Widow got into her beehive, but it was a fun kind of cheesiness. The kind you'd use to relax while eating popcorn. When we become invested in the characters, the stories are better. Riverdale helped us relate to Betty. The fourth tale had the strongest Riverdale vibe. An unsettling Halloween tale that might have appeared in an Archie's comic. It is what the love triangle might have become if it had been more violent. It was a good time because there was so much campiness, a love triangle mess, and Riverdale fun. Playboy Archie finally received the punishment for his online dating games. Also, a Betty and Veronica collaboration. Count me in. Betty and Veronica slicing Archie in half was a great twist. The plot concerned the girl's struggles with a lover who only had their best interests at heart. Giving him a dose of his medication seemed like the correct course of action. Did he really believe the females would never interact with one another? He wasn't quite as smooth as the basketball squad claimed. And why did Cheryl consent to meet him for a date? She wasn't a nice friend, she was aware of how much of a player he was. With Veronica's evaluation at the conclusion, the story's main lesson was revealed. Did you concur with her assessment of Jughead's pros? Each person's horror and story, taken separately, provided a different view of the world. But when you add them all up, Jughead was particularly critical of a lot of people. The girls were vain or predatory, while the boys were bullies or sex-obsessed manipulators. With the exception of Dilton, everyone received their just desserts. Jughead may distinguish himself, but he has a propensity to exalt himself. It's too bad that it ruined his chance at a relationship with Veronica. It was already over before it even started, just like a Riverdale romance. Thanks for watching. For more, subscribe.